Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Greg Brobmeyer as our speaker this evening for five crucial 2023 CDT code changes, administrative tips, and why they are important. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section and we'll answer them live at the end of the webinar. And CE is not available for this webinar live or on demand. Dr. Grobmeyer, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate everybody joining me tonight. I'm Dr. Greg Grobmeyer. We're going to be talking about the top five must-know CDT code changes in 2023. Probably going to give you a little more than five. I'm going to give you definitely some, some nuggets that you'll be able to walk away with and uh, take back to your practices. So, um, before we get too much into the actual code changes, I do want to talk a little bit about our sponsor for this evening, eAssist uh, Dental Solutions. So eAssist has been around for about or more than 10 years. Uh, their platform has been putting money back into the pockets of the nation's dedicated dentists, reducing the stress of their teams and creating a reliable cash flow. Uh, their platform is comprised of dental billing specialists serving over 2,600 dental offices and DSOs. To date, dental billing specialists using our platform have collected more than, get this, $11.34 billion from insurance companies. That number always blows me away. I, and I keep seeing it go up. Every time I do a, a webinar for eAssist, it's, it's amazing to me. Uh, how much money they are getting back in the pockets of dentists. This is money that they're owed. It's just not getting collected. Uh, ESS does a great job with that. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, ESS itself. Most of you who are familiar with ESS, think of it as a billing practice or account aging service. Um, they, you know, they work with insurance companies. And so, and you may not realize the other things that eAssist does uh, to serve dental practices. These are services that can also often take up a lot of time for the admin team. And these are hours that you're paying them for. And so outsourcing these services sometimes can free up the time for the, for the front desk and admin team, give them opportunity to work on other processes that are best done within the practice themselves. So let's look at a few of the things that eAssist can do. Uh, again, eAssist's original focus was dental insurance filing and working outstanding claims, and they do that very, very well. Uh, that was their original core focus, and I'd say it probably still is their central focus, but they now do so much else. Uh, they offer credentialing services for dentists who may be starting out or who are new to a practice. It's a very complicated process. It is something you can do on your own, but uh, there's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross. Uh, eAssist has helped tremendous number of dentists be able to credential correctly, make sure that things are done smoothly, and they can certainly help you with that uh, service that they offer. Another huge time saver would be the insurance verification service that they have. It's unbelievable how much time is used by your team just sitting on the phone uh, talking, waiting to talk to somebody about to just ask a few questions about insurance benefits and eligibility. So eAssist has this service that they'll sit on the phone for you. They'll sit and wait. You're not paying one of your own team members to have to sit there on hold. Uh, they also offer accounting, bookkeeping, and payroll services. They understand the ins and outs of a dental practice often better than your local CPA might, but because all they do is they focus on dental practices. They know dental practices. Patient portion uh, statements and billing is another thing that they that they tackle. Uh, this means ESS has specialists who do statements and they do the calls. They work these old balances to collect them from patients. And that's kind of a, a dirty job. A lot of practices struggle with those phone calls. They don't know exactly what to say or how to say it. They don't know how to best uh, uh, collect that outstanding money. And so they prefer someone else to do the dirty work. eAssist will do that for you. And lastly, they offer what's called full schedule. Full schedule is uh, a service where they have specialists who will go into your practice management software. They'll look for overdue and recall patients, those that have pending treatment, and they'll get them back on the books. And so that's, that's a fantastic service. Dentists are often really, really happy to refer out 
clinical treatment. If they've got a root canal that seems too difficult, or they've got a uh, extraction that's that's close to the inferior alveolar nerve, they will take that out. What they'll do is they'll send it out to a specialist. And we're very comfortable doing so. So why should we not be comfortable also sending out to the specialist for administrative services? That's what EOSIS does. This is what they do all day long. This is all they do. And so with a focus on these particular services, they're very good at it. And uh, they can take that that weight off of your, your front desk team and allow them to get back to patient relationships, to get back to working on things within the office itself and allow somebody else to do uh, this numbers part. Uh, so that is eAssist. I just wanted to give a, a moment to talk about them. Now, I'll tell you a little bit myself. This is uh, this is me. I'm Dr. Greg Grobmeyer. I'm a coding expert with Dr. Charles Charles Blair's Practice Booster. I hope, hopefully you guys know Dr. Charles Blair. Uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of Dr. Blair's annually updated Coding with Confidence reference book, which I hope is in a lot of your offices and I hope a current copy is within a lot of your offices. I also am the chief editor of the bi-monthly insurance solutions newsletter. I'm a contributing editor to the uh, dental administration with confidence books, uh, the dental technology with confidence and dental documentation with confidence books. Those are two new uh, books that we're offering as of this year. I also host the dental code advisor podcast and do a lot of consulting and seminars and webinars for Henry Shine, E-Assist, Dental Zing, and Practice Booster, which is my parent company. So that's me. A little disclaimer before we get too deep in this. Uh, coding is presented as it is today. And so the things that we're saying are correct as of today. Uh, every year, codes are updated, and most of those codes are current and accurate from January 1st until December 31st of a given year. There are times where new codes are added in mid-year. We might be talking about that later. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the codes stay the same for one calendar year, and then they're updated each year. So as of today, this coding uh, is accurate and correct for 2023. So always code what you do. That's the golden rule of coding. Don't make, a, make things up to try to get a better reimbursement. Don't say something that you didn't do. Uh, make sure that you're very accurate in the words that you use and the codes that you use. So to follow that code set to the best of your ability. Lastly, I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving you health insurance advice uh, from a legal aspect. I'm giving it to you from our personal experience and expertise. Uh, if you do need a legal advice, please contact a healthcare attorney uh, in your given state. So what we hope you're going to walk away with today, we're going to talk about these five CDT code changes. We're going to talk about some admin tips and why these changes are important to you in your practice. We're going to talk about uh, how dental billing and coding expertise can get you to the finish line faster with less stress how we can help that bottom line, okay? Uh, we're also gonna discover what CDT ch code uh, changes mean for you and how you need to adapt your internal processes to deal with these codes, to, to integrate these codes into your practice and reduce unhappy patients. So let's first talk about the money aspect of this because I know that's why a lot of you guys are on here. It's a, it's a chief concern in every dental practice. So. Did you know to over two thirds of dental practices? Now this is a figure that we've gotten from uh, the NADP, the National Association of Dental Plans. 70% uh, of dentists are leaving 9% of collectible revenue on the table each month. So that means that's 9% of money that they are due, they are owed legitimately that is not being collected. So the vast, vast majority of, of uh, practices are in this situation. And now let's look at that. 9% sounds like a lot, but think about it in this, this, this term. That 9% is pure overhead. That's pure profit. We're talking about after all the expenses are paid. So uh, that 9% goes to the bottom line. If we look at a practice that has 60% overhead, for example, and a 40% profit margin, then this is 9% that's getting added to that 
Okay. So we just actually increased the profit margin by 25%, which that's an even more significant jump. That's 25% more money that you can put back into staff salaries, your own retirement, uh, improvements for the office, things like that. So that's that's critical. Let's look at how that actually plays out in numbers. Uh, again, this, this is a figure from the ADA's uh, Health Policy Institute. This is a number from 2020, so it's a little dated, but it's the most uh, accurate revision uh, that they have. Uh, average dental gross billings of a practice, $732,000. I know a lot of you guys are doing more than that. And so most of the offices that I consult with are million dollar plus offices. And so very common to see that. But let's just look if it was a $732,000 practice, 9%, that's $66,000 uh, in, a, in a given year that is just People are like, eh, whatever, it, you know, I'm not going to collect that or I'm not getting that uh, or they're not doing it effectively. And so over 40 years in practice, which is the average kind of lifespan of how long a dentist practices, that's $2.6 million. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And so that's and that's pure profit money. That's that's there's no overhead coming out of that. So and that's with a $732,000 practice. Think about it, what it is for your office. It's significant. All right. So a lot of these claims uh, are denied. A lot of this money that's not being collected is because claims are being denied. And those could be denied due to incorrect CDT coding. It could be due to missing documentation, uh, attachments, uh, delays in submission, timely filing issues. Those are all things that we help with uh, with through Practice Booster and through eAssist. So if you've got updated coding resources, you're going to have a lot less chance of these problems occurring. So did you know that only 33% of claims that are, denied are ever, that are denied are ever appealed? Only a third. Two-thirds of claims, once that uh, denial hits the office, they're dead in the water. Nobody does anything with them. A lot of those claims are appealable claims that would be paid if an appeal was processed. And so I highly encourage your insurance administrator within your office to uh, look at these denials that they're getting and see if there's any way that they can get appealed. Sometimes it's just changing a code number or data service. It's clarifying something. Uh, it may be incorrect documentation. Uh, it could just be the wrong code. So these are all things that could be appealed and then you actually get paid for it and not leave it out there in the pockets of the insurance company. So got a little poll here. I want to let you guys uh, participate in. Do you currently use a coding resource to help send clean claims? So this could be a website, a book, uh, a service. Uh, are you guys currently using a resource. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to answer just yes or no. Nobody sees your answers. Nobody knows who's saying this. So feel free to anonymously uh, answer this question. I'm just curious. And let's see uh, if most offices are doing it or not. So let's see. Looks like we got a return of about 67, 68% that say yes, 34. Good, 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 good. So about, you know, two thirds of you are using some sort of resource and I'm happy to see that. My follow-up question is not a poll question, but how old are your coding resources? That's, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second too. Uh, did you know that uh, even insurances are, are dentists that are fee for service? You have no participation, no contracts with anybody. Even if you're not participating, it's still up to you to accurately report every procedure. You're still open to insurance audits, state board audits, and other agency audits uh, coming into your office and make sure that you're doing things incorrect. Because uh, the, the focus of an audit is not just to see whether you're uh, trying to do insurance fraud or something like that. They are looking for making sure that treatment build was necessary. They're looking to make sure that it meets the standard of care. And they're also making sure that everything was reported accurately. Uh, insurance audits are a scary thing. I don't know if you've ever been through one, 
but there's so many things that can open the door to an audit. Usually these things are not uh, randomly chosen. They're because you have certain patterns in your billing history. And so if, if for whatever reason, your core buildup ratio to crown ratio is really high, then they're going to begin to question, why is your core buildup ratio so high? If your uh, surgical extractions are really, really high compared to what your simple extractions are, and you're not a surgical practice, then that may flag things. You're wanting to make sure that you've got fantastic ironclad documentation that backs up what you are submitting. And uh, because you're not just documenting for insurance companies, you're not just documenting for yourself and for in internal uses, you're wanting to make sure that what you're putting in that chart, uh, it may be seen eventually by the patient. It may be seen on down the road by a state board. It may be seen eventually by an attorney. You're wanting to make sure that the documentation that you're sending in is absolutely spot on and uh, that you're getting everything in there that you need to do. Did you know that every, every x-ray that you're uh, doing within your office needs to be uh, diagnosed or, or needs to be recommended by the dentist and that needs to be documented in the charting? Okay. If you're not uh, saying that this FMX that you're taking is needing to be uh, is, is needing to be done, uh, the provider suggested that, then an auditor can actually come into your office and say these were not uh, or, or suggested by the provider as needed care, and we can take back some money for these comp uh, or these full mouth series. Well, they can they can do that. And so we're wanting to make sure that your documentation is absolutely ironclad. So this is my buddy. This is Dr. Charles Blair. He is the the goat of a practice booster and for dental coding. Uh, he's been out there for over 20 years, putting out the coding with confidence manual. Uh, Dr. Blair says correct coding often results in higher revenue as practices obtain reimbursements that were once unpaid because of misunderstanding or misrepresented codes. So the golden rule of dentistry is to always code what you do. I know there are circumstances where uh, one more than one code is applicable. And we try to teach uh, through our books and seminars and webinars, uh, which one of these codes is going to be more profitable if there's multiple codes that are applicable at a given time. So we give coding strategies. And so that's, but, but never fabricate things, never say something you didn't do. So, but without up-to-date coding resources, you don't even know if what you're reporting is accurate. Uh, it puts the practice at risk for audits and for lost revenue. So let's look this year alone, how many code changes do you think happened to CDT? I wonder if anybody knows. This year alone, we had 38 total changes, okay? Uh, in 2022, we had 46 changes. And I don't have it on this table here, but the year before that, 2021, we had 61 changes altogether. That plus some, some COVID vaccine codes that were kind of thrown in in the mix. If you guys have not updated your coding references since the pandemic, you are 160 code changes behind, 160 code changes. And a lot of those are code changes that are affecting codes that you're using each and every day. In fact, a few of the codes that I'm focusing in on today are legacy codes. They're codes that have been around forever. They're codes that are in daily use uh, and there have been changes to those. If you're not aware of those changes, then I promise that you're miscoding uh, you're going to get delays. You're going to get denials. You're not getting the money back in your pocket as quickly as you need to. And so we're wanting to help you with that. So talking about uh, those particular codes, a little, this year alone, okay, these are the codes that we're going to focus in on. Uh, we had 22 brand new codes. Now, those new codes are for things that uh, they are new technologies, things that may not have existed before. These may be codes that uh, a lot of people were submitting as a 999 unspecified by report. Uh, if there's a pattern of doing that, then 
then someone may say, hey, we need a CDT code for this particular procedure. There's a gap here. Uh, something's not right. So they'll create new codes in those situations. A lot of times they'll be replacing existing codes. Over the last few years, there's been a movement to take uh, a single code and break it into uh, a maxillary and a mandibular variant of those two codes. And so that might be a uh, reason for new codes. We had two deleted codes this year. Uh, one of those had a replacement. One of those did not. Uh, we also had 14 revisions. And this year, all of the revisions were substantive revisions. Now, what I mean by that, uh, you'll see the far right column over there says editorial revisions. Editorial revisions are changes to grammar or wording or something simple that uh, punctuation, something that doesn't really change what the code means or how it's used. Last year, we had 10 of those. Uh, they don't really count for much, but substantive substantive revisions do. That means these are changes that actually change the scope of the code. It changes how those codes are reported, how they are used on a day-to-day -day basis. And so all 14 of the revisions this year were substantive revisions. We also had, uh, like I said, some COVID vaccine codes that were put in uh, that actually went into the mid-year update for last year. And so, and then last year we had some that were put in from the year before that. So let's actually get into these five coding changes that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first one of these is a code that I promise every office, uh, if you're a general, general practice, is using every single day. And that is 210. D0210 Intraoral Comprehensive Series of Radiographic Images has been altered for 2023. Now, there were a couple different parts of it that were changed. Uh, the top line of one of these CDT codes, there's the code number on the, on the left. The, the big text there is what's called the nomenclature. And then the small text below it is what's called the descriptor. Now, the descriptor kind of clarifies uh, a little bit more about what they mean in the nomenclature. Now, all these codes are put out by the ADA. The American Dental Association is responsible for these codes. Uh, they meet in March every single year. They go over the suggested changes to the CDT code. They vote on them, and then they send them out to us. So this year, this is one of the changes that they felt was necessary. Uh, the first part of this change was kind of a simple part, and that's going from the word complete to the word comprehensive. They like the word comprehensive better. Comprehensive really means all-encompassing. We're looking at everything. Uh, we're wanting to make sure that that all the parts that need to be looked at are looked at. And so they like that word. They've changed complete to comprehensive. That's kind of a small change. A bigger part of this change is the second issue. And that, if you notice, they're taking out uh, the text that said usually consisting of 14 to 22 periapical and posterior bite wing images. So what they've done is they've taken the number off. There's not a specified number anymore. Uh, the rationale for revision, uh, they thought that the, the definition of a whole mouth radiographic survey is a little bit at the discretion of the dentist. So they're, they're trying to get more utilitarian. Uh, they just want to make sure that, and this is the important part, is the second part, it's intended to display the crowns and roots of all teeth, periapical areas, and then this is new stuff here, interproximal areas, which means they're wanting to make sure that you have clear, non-overlapping, probably bite wing radiographs, but every interproximal area needs to be clear. So that's, that's diagnostic quality radiographs for in the posterior and alveolar bone, including edentulous areas. A lot of your offices may not be taking pictures where there are no teeth. And so this is something that they're saying needs to be done. Now, how those pictures are taken is at the discretion of the dentist, but they're wanting to be sure that to be able to call it a comprehensive series of radiographic images, they were also looking uh, in edentulous areas, we're looking for any pathology that may be there. Uh, it doesn't have to be associated with the tooth. So 
that's that's the big change there. There is no more set number. We just have to make sure that there's a picture of absolutely everything, crown, periapical area, interproximal area, and alveolar bone, including edentulous areas. Okay. Next change, and this is a substantial one that I really want to talk about, okay? Uh, the D4355, full mouth debridement to enable comprehensive periodontal evaluation and diagnosis on a subsequent visit. That's the new verbiage. The old verbiage had the word oral in there instead of periodontal, okay? Uh, and they've taken off the entire descriptor of this particular code. And so this is when you've got that patient, they, they present to the office, they sit down, you're looking in the mouth, they've got one tooth that goes from molar to molar. Uh, it's one solid wall of calculus. You can't do diagnosis if you can't probe. And so uh, in that particular circumstance, it's necessary to remove some of the plaque, some of the calculus, whatever the obstruction is, in order to be able to get a clear diagnosis of the teeth and gingival health. And so uh, they specifically wanted to point out that this is to enable a comprehensive periodontal evaluation. So, you know, the, the gums, that's, that's what they're, that they're concerned about. They, uh, the original uh, proposal, when they came into change, they had a few rationales for this change. Uh, one, they felt this was restrictive. They thought that the, the dentist's clinical judgment uh, uh, was limited by this. There's no evidence available to support the accuracy or inaccuracy of diagnosis made immediately after full mouth debridement compared to a diagnosis at a subsequent appointment at any duration of time. That's in reference to the removal of this language at the bottom. You'll notice it says uh, that, that it interferes with the ability to uh, perform a comprehensive oral evaluation, not to be completed on the same day as D150, D160, or D180. Well, they've removed that language now. And so uh, they also felt that it limited access uh, for vulnerable patient groups. So access to care issues. If you've got a patient that's having to come off of blood thinners, if you've got a nursing home patient, if you've got a patient that has difficulty traveling for whatever reason, they wanted you to be able to do more on the initial visit, okay? Um, and so it's in not in keeping with the scientific evidence that this CDT code is to attend a full mouth probing to facilitate a comprehensive periodontal exam, the extent of which is to obtain accurate periodontal probing depths. And so you've got to be able to probe in order to be able to do a comprehensive periodontal evaluation. We're going to talk about how to interpret this and, and what's what that means. So here's, here's a big deal. We've, we uh, went to print with uh, the ADA has actually come out this particular month in January. December 15th is when it was released. It was actually went into effect as of January. They've got a brand new uh, guide to reporting the full mouth debridement, the 4355. Now, for Practice Booster ourselves, that caused a little bit of an issue, okay? Um, if the patient presents uh, here with gross, you know, plaque and calculus, ADA has got this guide. I want you guys to be able to use your, your smartphones, whatever. You can scan this image. Uh, that's going to take you directly to that link. I've got the first paragraph of this pulled up here, but this is actually a multiple page document. Uh, and it's going to outline a lot of the questions and things uh, with this code. Now, when this came out in, we, you know, the code maintenance committee met in March. We got our information in May and we worked over the next several months trying to put together our interpretations and, uh, and, uh, and the way that we uh, felt that this, this code was, was to be interpreted. We talked with ADA on several occasions, uh, sent in our write-up, you know, to discuss different aspects of it together, uh, live over Zoom and everything, had a great uh, write-up for it. And that's what went to press as of summer of 2022. Now, since then, 
uh, the ADA in association with AAP. They've kind of gotten some further discussions happening and they decided to slightly modify what their interpretation was compared to what we had first set out and put into the Coding with Confidence manual. So if you guys have a print copy of Coding with Confidence 2023, note that D4355 has some incorrect information in there. We are currently going through, we've spent the last several days rewriting our entire entry, going through, we just, I, I just spent a couple of hours on the phone with ADA today, going through that particular interpretation and all the ins and outs. We've got new flow charts. We've got new entry uh, for D4355. We'll be pushing that out to anybody that bought a book can email to info at practicebooster.com. That, that's going to be at the end of the lecture as well. Info at practicebooster.com. We're going to get that new write-up, that new flow chart. Uh, it's going to be updated automatically in our eBooks and on our Code Advisor online. So if you're a subscriber to Practice Booster, you're using the Code Advisor. As soon as we have this document completed, it's going to be automatically update online. Currently, as it stands in the print version, and currently, as of today, online, it's not correct, okay? So be conscious of that. Here is what uh, a proper interpretation as of today should be, okay? If you've got a patient that presents with, with gross plaque and calculus that's inhibiting a periodontal evaluation, um, a D4355 should be performed. But in order to first, the first step is to establish the need of that, okay? And so before you do anything, as, as this flow diagram goes, you can you have to do some type of little cursory exam on the patient to establish the need for the D4355. And this must be documented in a chart, okay? And so this can be done a couple of ways. You can just write in the chart, you know, that the, the doctor looked, uh, the dentist, you know, evaluated the patient and felt that it was needed to do a 4355 for a more comprehensive evaluation. You can also uh, actually report, and this was ADA's uh, suggestion, was to do a D0191. That's an assessment of the patient, okay? That's usually done at no charge. That's a great way to document uh, both in the chart and uh, in what you're reporting that this assessment was done, this cursory exam was done. You may also do a D0140. That's the limited exam. Now, the nice thing about the limited oral evaluation is that you can actually put a fee with that. You can you can charge for that. And so now that does burn up an evaluation for the patient. It does uh, go into their, uh, you know, their limitations of an insurance plan. But doing a, a D0191 or D0140 establishes the need for the D4355. And so that's step one. Now, normally... And ideally, in most cases, you're going to have a subsequent visit. You're going to do the 4355 today. Then you're going to allow a period of healing. Uh, that's at the judgment of the clinician, but it, it's normally about 14 days. You're going to get them back for a subsequent visit. At that subsequent visit, ideally, again, you'd be doing a D0180. That's the uh, comprehensive periodontal evaluation diagnosis. All right. ADA has said, however, enabling a comprehensive periodontal evaluation does not mean that you're locked into doing that particular evaluation. So there's two parts of this that have changed, okay? Uh, as of January 1st, if there are access to care issues, if the patient is, is difficult to get back for that subsequent appointment after a healing time, you can go ahead and do a D0150 on the same date of service as the 4355. That's a big change, okay? So if there are access to care issues, you can do your, your comprehensive oral exam the same day. You may also do, if it's, if it's a patient of record that's been there uh, within three years, you could even do a periodic. You could do a D0120. Um, that's probably not going to happen very frequently if they've got a, a full mouth that needs to brighting. You probably haven't seen them in a while. 
But uh, that that is a possibility. Those two codes, D0120, D0150, could be done on the same date of service as 4355 if needed. It's not ideal, okay? It's not in the best interest of the patient unless the patient has specific circumstances that make that prudent. So at the second appointment, Again, I said, ideally, it's a, it's a comprehensive periodontal evaluation. That's the D0180. That's six-point probing and charting. Uh, you're doing uh, uh, bleeding points and clinical attachment loss and radiographs, and you're, 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 you're taking all this stuff. You're making sure that these things are done. Uh, that's ideal. Uh, ADA does say if the, uh, for whatever reason, that is not uh done at that second appointment, you also have the option of doing a D0150 or even a D0120, okay, again, at the second visit. Now, note at that first visit, I did not say a D0180. If you're debriding that day, you cannot get accurate probing depths due to how the gums are going to be. They're going to be messed up. So you cannot do a comprehensive periodontal evaluation in the first visit. You could do one of those other ones. Uh, second visit, you could do any one of the three, okay? D0120, D0150, D0180. 80 being what we consider the best because it does provide the most information on the periodontal status of the patient. And as far as from a reimbursement standpoint, it can reimburse better. It may reimburse better, not always but it can. So if you're doing that extra work, why not get paid for it, okay? If they remap it back to a, uh, a D0150, then let them, but you're at least trying to go for the gold. You're trying to, if you're doing that extra work, go ahead and code the D0180, all right? Uh, so that's ideal. Uh, so, and then after pro proper diagnosis, you're gonna end up being able to roll this patient into uh, a prophy if the inflammation is mild or if it's localized, or they may go to a D4346. That's if inflammation is moderate to severe with no bone loss. So in these particular in those two particular situations, there's no bone loss. But if there's less than 30% generalized inflammation, you could do a prophy. If it's more than 30% generalized inflammation, uh, if it's more or scattered around the mouth, 4346 is your better code, okay? If there is bone loss, of course, and this is probably going to be the case in most circumstances, you're going to be doing the 4341 or 4342 uh, periodontal scaling and root planing, all right? So that is uh, an ideal scenario. And then there are some other workflows that may happen in access to care issues or issues where they don't qualify, uh, for a particular type of exam. Again, we will have new updated flow charts on this. Uh, this ADA's guide to reporting that I've got put up here in front of you goes through a whole lot of what I just talked about. So if you wanna go through and make sure that your questions are answered, I highly advise you find this ADA guide and make sure that it's consistent with your understanding of reporting D4355. And I'm sure I'll probably have some questions about that uh, at the end of this uh, uh, webinar. So I want to move on, make sure we get everything covered. The next uh, code that I want to talk about at having an update is the palliative treatment. Now, palliative is one of these underutilized codes. A lot of people, when they have an emergency visit, they're doing a limited, they're doing a D0140. And that's great. That works in a lot of circumstances. It does burn up an evaluation for the patient. But there are cases where palliative treatment does better. It may even pay better, depending on what uh, the treatment is. Okay, uh, palliative can be used in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, it could be any time that the patient is complaining about something uh, to you. It's an uh, an irritation. They've got pain. They've got discomfort of some sort, and you're able to do something minor to kind of fix it. It's not curative. It's it's just for now. We're going to get you where you're feeling better, and we'll we'll deal with everything later. So here are the changes that were made to palliative this year. Prior to January 1st of this year, palliative was really the only care, the only definitive care that you could deliver on a date of service, okay? You couldn't do anything else. 
So that was because of the word emergency. I also said minor procedure. Uh, it's on a per visit basis for emergency treatment of pain. Well, ADA felt like emergency and minor procedure were ill-defined. Uh, so they've taken that off. What they're now saying is that you can do palliative on the same date of service as other dental work in another area of the mouth. So let's say you've got a patient and you've got them in and they're doing fillings. You're doing fillings on the lower right, okay? But the patient is like, I've got this one on my lower left over here that's, that's broken off and it's just cutting my tongue. And you polish that off over there. That could be now reported as palliative care, even though it's the same date of service that you did definitive work somewhere else in the mouth. Okay, so you can report palliative care uh, on the same date of service as other definitive care, as long as it's not in the same area. You can't smooth the tooth right in front of the ones that you know to do the fillings. Okay, that, that's, that's not consistent with the code. We wanna make sure that you're using this correctly. Um, some examples of, of things you could do uh, with the palliative treatment, uh, smoothing stuff off, adjusting uh, a filling, uh, uh, not a filling you just did, uh, and so we're not talking about adjusting something that you just took care of, but uh, adjusting occlusion for pain relief, uh, removing some decay and putting some IRM or some temporary filling material into something until you can do it later. Uh, desensitizing due to discomfort that they're complaining about. Uh, and that's the only thing you're doing, you know, at that for that particular area. You may just want to do that as a as a palliative. And we've got different um, coding scenarios and strategies about when this one pays better versus this one. That's all stuff we teach in our lectures and webinars. Uh, opening a tooth. Uh, if you've got a patient that's coming in, they're complaining of a toothache, you can open it up and get the nerve out and get them out of pain that day. There's a couple of scenarios there. If they're going the pathway of uh, ending up doing, you're gonna do the root canal later. You're just opening up the tooth right now to get them out of pain. Well, you could do the 3221, the, the uh, debridement code, the pulpal debridement code. But if you do that, and then you follow it up in the same office with a root canal, what we often see is payers taking back the, the fee that they paid you for the, uh, for the access, for the pulpal debridement. They take that out of the, the final root canal uh, reimbursement, and then I'm saying, hey, that was really just the first step of the root canal. OK, if you had instead coded that as palliative, they can't touch it. They can't take it back. OK, uh, that's a separate procedure. However, if you're opening the tooth and you're going to refer them out to an endodontist, well, it's better to code that out as a 3221, pulpal debridement, because in that situation, that's going to pay better from the payer. And it's not you doing the root canal. Somebody else is doing it, so they can't take it back. So that's an example of one of the strategies that we're teaching. So next, intraoral tomosynthesis. I stuck this one on here. There's actually six codes related to tomosynthesis. Tomosynthesis is a new uh, technology that a lot of you guys may not know about. So there are codes now for comprehensive series, for a PA, for um, uh, also a bite wing. Okay. And so, and there's codes for image capture only, as well as the regular one. Now, what tomosynthesis is? Stationary intraoral tomosynthesis is a, uh, it's an imaging technique that's been used in mammography and medicine for many, many years. They've now got it adapted for dental use. It looks like a normal x-ray head in that you would have in an operatory, okay, that you're using for intraoral uh, digital radiography. Now, you've also got a sensor that looks like the intraoral digital sensor that you've been using right now. It's a little bit bigger, but not a lot. What it, what's different about it is this x-ray head has a collimator in there using carbon nano, nanotubules. They actually do seven different sources of radiation, seven different directions of radiation hits the intraoral sensor, and then the computer can differentiate between those different angulations and can compute synthetically a three-dimensional image of that's, that's on that intraoral sensor. And so you've just taken a PA or a bite wing that you can scroll through buccalingually. 
And so this is a fantastic technology. So you can, you can if you've got an overlapping contact, you can scroll to a layer where the, the contact's not overlapped. Uh, if you've got a, a buckle amalgam that's an obstruction, you can actually uh, zoom past that and look at the interior pulp uh, chamber. Uh, if you have, uh, you're doing a root canal and you want to uh, identify and just look at the lingual uh, root, if you want to see, you know, how these things curve and things you can tell by essentially what was, it's the same form factor as an intraoral digital radiograph. So fantastic, cool new technology. Right now it's only available from a company called Surround Medical out of North Carolina. Uh, it's the Portray system. I do believe it will be uh, offered through uh, the normal dental dental uh, clear uh, sales houses, including Henry Shine at some point. Uh, I believe that's being worked on currently, but it's a cool new technology that I wanted you guys aware of. One last thing we're going to talk about, and that's a change to the definition of porcelain ceramic. This isn't a code change. It's a definitions change. Porcelain ceramic uh, got changed several years ago. Um, uh, prior to that change, it said, you know, if it had any resin in it at all, it was considered resin restoration. They changed it to anything that was predominantly uh, inorganic or refractory compounds, including porcelains, glasses, ceramics, or glass ceramics. Uh, that language is there, and that allowed lava crowns to be coded as porcelain ceramic at that time. Now, uh, but, but that's they still had these fabrication qualifiers on there. Pressed, fired, polished, or milled. Pressed, fired, polished, or milled. So this year, ADA has taken off pressed, fired, polished, or milled. That opens up uh, porcelain ceramic to be any material by any fabrication method that is predominantly, aka over 50%, inorganic refractory compounds. So 3D printed porcelain restorations are now reportable in uh, 2023. And there are several uh, companies out there that are announcing, releasing uh, materials that meet these guidelines, greater than 50% fill. So be looking out for those. Uh, so if you're in the market for a 3D printer, make sure you're buying the right one, one of these that can print porcelain. I'm being told, uh, you know, for, I've heard numbers anywhere from $3 to $20 per unit for porcelain restoration. Now, how they hold up, how they wear, uh, their possibility, that all kind of remains to be seen. Um, you know, I, I probably would feel comfortable, you know, uh, doing inlays, onlays. I don't know about full crowns yet. We'll see. We'll see. But this is the, you know, one of the, this is the beginning of this. This is a, a new era. Uh, for 3D printing of porcelain restorations. I'm sure they're just going to get better and better and better. And so uh, those can now be, uh, and they're, they're, it's using the, the same uh, coating uh, as traditional porcelain ceramic. There is no difference uh, if you're doing it milled, if you're doing it laboratory fabricated, uh, hand stacked, whatever, 3D it doesn't matter. It's all reported using the same codes you've been using to report porcelain ceramic. There's no changes to that. Uh, this is this is just opening up what can be reported. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by this, that was a lot. Okay. I know, I know we uh we dumped a lot on you. There's 160 code changes over the last three years. It's a lot to dig through. It's a lot to go through. So I want to make sure that you guys uh are have access to a lot of the great coding resources that are out there. Uh, contact your Henry Schein field rep. They're going to get you hooked up. Um, my particular product, Dr. Blair's product, uh, Practice Booster's product, and there's a whole team of us working on this uh, each and every year. Uh, it's the Coding with Confidence book. Uh, if you scan here, you're getting a, a free uh, sample of what the Coding with Confidence book. We also have our online uh, code advisor through practicebooster.com. Uh, please go there and check that out. See what's going on. Uh, there's five new books. There's a coding book, an administration book, technology book, documentation book, and a medical dental cross coding book. If you guys are doing medical dental cross coding at all, all those CD, CPT codes and ICD-10 codes, 
and you don't know exactly how to cross-reference them to your CDT codes, that book takes care of it. It's a huge, it's giant, uh, massive, massive book. So please look into those resources, check them out. Uh, the code, the Coding with Confidence book is 550 pages. The admin book is over 400 pages. It's a lot of material. It's really good stuff, but uh, it breaks down those 800 CDT codes and what you need to know, uh, both the, uh, uh, the, not only how you code, but also narratives you write and tips and uh, what which code versus this other code is the best one to submit for this particular situation. So what to do, what not to do, all that's there. So we got a little while left. I'm going to throw into q and I know we've got a, a, a whole bunch of questions and answers over here. I'm going to try to kind of look um, and see, could you do a periodic exam to establish the need for 4355? That's the first one that popped up there. Uh, periodic exam is going to be, um, it's got to be an established patient, a patient of record. So it can't be a situation where, um, you know, it's a new patient coming in and that is not a comprehensive type of, of evaluation. Uh, the assessment or the limited is really the better codes to code at that initial visit, because what you're doing is you're just saying, I'm looking, I'm just establishing the need for the D4355. Uh, that's that's the purpose of that little cursory exam. Now, if you decided that um, that it was appropriate and that day you wanted to go on and do an exam because of access to care issues, yeah, you could do a periodic exam. Uh, that's a very specific and probably small use uh, situation, however, because it had to be a patient of record that's got enough buildup to need a 4355. But uh, so they've, they've, but they've been seen within three years. So that's, that's kind of a, you know, small, small opportunity for that particular uh, use. So yes. And what's the circumstance that allows you to do D4355 and 150 on the same day? I think I just kind of addressed that. It's access to care. That's, that's the particular reasons. Now it doesn't specify uh, that, that, you know, by rule, you could do the, uh, a 150 or a 120 uh, on the same day. Uh, the ideal treatment of that patient is to get them back for a subsequent visit after healing. Okay. So it's not really the best scenario for most patients. But if that patient can't get back to the practice, they've got a health issue, there's something that's, uh, that's driving you towards having to do an exam that day then it's now legal to do so as of January the 1st. So uh, medical crossover codes required. Uh, that's, yeah, and things, there are several of these popping up here. If they're not included with the CDT code, will it be denied for payment? That's going to be payer specific, okay? Uh, first off, you're not required to bill medical uh, as a dental office. You don't have to. It's your choice. Um, but if you're choosing to do so, many of the medical payers are going to take CDT codes. Some of them don't. Some of them want certain forms. Some of them want certain things. They will always want the, uh, the ICD codes, uh, the CPT codes, ICD, I'm sorry, CDT codes that we use. Those are codes that talk about what you're doing. Okay. Uh, so CPT codes in uh, are the equivalent in medicine, and those are uh, procedural codes. So what you're doing, but most of the medical billing stuff wants ICD-10 codes. That's an uh, international classification of disease version 10. It's why are you doing what you're doing, and so it's actually establishing the need, and it's huge. There are so many ICD-10 codes. If you're trying to get into medical billing, I highly suggest that you find a medical billing little help somewhere. It could be our cross coding book, take some webinars, take some lectures. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, they're very specific about needing some ICD-10 codes going along with it. Even some of these uh, 
uh, filing of uh, cone beams and things like that that could get covered by medical in certain situations. Uh, they're wanting ICD-10 codes to go along with that in a lot of circumstances, but it's payer specific. So it's not required. It's It may be required by certain payers. It's not universally required. So I hope that, uh, I hope that helps. So um, let's see. Sorry. Trying to dig through these. What companies are making the 3D printed material restorations? I know Sprint Ray just announced theirs. Uh, it works with a, a couple of their printers. I don't know that it works with all of them. Uh, I'm also familiar with uh, Desktop Health has got one. And there's one more I'm trying to think of that I'm aware of. I can't remember what it is now off the top of my head. But uh, if you've got a 3D printer, check with your, with your company to see if they're coming out with a material that will meet this requirement. A lot of those materials can also be used uh, by different machines. Uh, so reach out to your company and, and check things out through them. So let's see. So after you've done the 4355 and they come back with a comp after healing, does it have to be a D180 or still 150? It doesn't have to be D180. D180 is ideal being that and it's ideal as far as for best reimbursement. That's what you're, that's the best code to use. Uh, and it's also the, if you look at the nomenclature of the 4355 code, it actually says to enable a comprehensive periodontal evaluation. So in ideal circumstances, that would be what you deliver, the D180. Okay. And so that said, a couple of things here. It may not always be able, uh, the D180 has specifics. It's for signs and symptoms of periodontal disease, okay? And you could argue that having a bridge of calculus on there is a risk factor for periodontal disease uh, so or for other risk factors of periodontal disease, such as smoking or diabetes. That's not an extensive list. That's a couple examples. So if you've got a condition such as smoking or diabetes, that increases the odds of you having uh, periodontal disease, you can do the six-point probing and charting in this, and all the, the work that goes along with that and code it as a D0180. Now, payers may compensate that at a higher level. They may remap it for compensation to a D0150. But don't shoot yourself in the foot by going ahead and doing a 150, if you could have done a 180, you're going to get better reimbursement with the 180. Now, it's at your clinical discretion, however, if you feel like that patient uh, does not meet all the little, the little I's dotted and T's crossed to call it a comprehensive periodontal evaluation for whatever reason, you absolutely can call that a 150, or you can even call it a periodic 120. And so that, that can be done. Let's see. And to follow along with that, at that next visit, if you did do a uh, uh, a one a one two zero or a one five zero at that initial visit, and then you're getting them back to look at them at another time, okay? You've already done your comp exam then, uh, so that that next visit, there's not a code just for periodontal probing and charting. There's there's not a code for that. So at that next visit, what you're doing is you're reassessing the condition of their gingival health. And so at that time, you can actually do a re-evaluation code. That's the D0171. D0171 is a reassessment post-operatively uh, of a patient. And so that's a great code to use if it's not one that you're currently using. So it's a reassessment. So anytime that you're getting a patient back that you've done work on, to, to look at it again, this is a code that you could use. And while you're doing that, you could do uh, more probing and charting uh, at that additional visit. Uh, said so you could do hygienists. I'm trying to see which, which of these work to answer. So does D4355 need or require a 140 or 191 prior to the uh, 
to the RDH. It doesn't require necessarily the, the 140 or the 191, but it does require the dentist looking uh, to make that diagnosis of need before anybody touches them to do the to do the debridement. So that needs to be documented in the chart. So there's really three ways that you can do that. You can say in your documentation, uh, Dr. Peterson came in and did a cursory exam in order to establish uh, you know, the need for uh, D4355 full mouth debridement. Or you can actually use the codes, uh, 140, the limited exam, or the 191 assessment of a patient. Assessment of a patient, we usually say don't charge. That's usually a no charge thing. Uh, the 140 is something that you could get reimbursed on. You are going to burn up an evaluation for that patient, but it is going to give you the best reimbursement. So can you take an FMX with 4355? Yes. Uh, the, the radiographs can be done at the first visit or at the second visit. Now, what you will want to do is do them after debriding the patient. And so after you've gotten all the uh, calculus off the teeth, then you could do the full mouth series, the x-rays that day. Or if you choose to do them at the second visit, that's fine also. So oh, there's a question here about alternating. That's 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 one that always gets the perio people kind of flagged up. Uh Am I going to have an issue filing a prophy at the six week reavial following SRP and then putting them into recare on three uh, 49 tens? Okay. So here's our suggestion on that. There are insurance companies that say uh, uh, once you're in 49 10, they'll pay it forever. Delta does that. Okay. There are others that say uh, once you've had SRP and you're doing 49 tens, if you ever do a prophy, well, we're going to kick it out of SRP. We're not going to allow for 4910s anymore. You've you've said that it's uh, that by doing a profi, you've said they're healthy. Okay, which if you actually read the coding, that's not true. A profi is not a statement of gingival health. It is supportive and preventative in care. It is not therapeutic. So there are a lot of insurance companies that do reimburse for 4910 and then a profi and then a 4910 and then a profi in one given year. But you don't know which companies those are necessarily unless you're tracking them all. So you've got certain companies that say, if you ever do a profi, I'm never going to pay for a 4910 again. You've got other companies that are saying, well, hey, I'll pay for a 49, two 4910s and two profis per year. So what's the easiest way to get around that? The easiest way, what we suggest, is to uh, report 4910s every time you're seeing that patient. But then in your uh, remarks section, I want you to write, uh, if benefits are not available for D4910, please consider the alternative benefit of a profi as a profi was delivered as part of the 4910, because it was. You you polished and you scaled above the teeth when you were doing 4910. 4910 really means you have to be scaling below the gingiva to call it a 4910, really, uh, if you're keeping up with that. So that's a way to kind of get around that alternating thing. So that's, that's where you're going to get that. Uh, can I ask, access this info online with insurance newsletter? instead of having the book on my desk. Let me tell you this, we're, we've got eBooks coming out this year. So that's great. So we've got several different formats now, okay? Uh, for Practice Booster, we've got the physical book in which we believe everything to be correct except for 4355, which we're all pushing out our updates about right now. We have Code Advisor Online, which is a service that you can subscribe to. You can actually type in a number, you can type in a keyword, uh, whatever. If you've got a particular product that you're looking to see how to code, a lot of times those will be in there too. You can put it in the keywords, it'll do a search. Uh, and it gives you the breakdown, what to do, what not to do, common miscodings, uh, tips, narratives, photos, all that stuff is on there, just like is in the book. 
That's Code Advisor Online. This year, we now have eBooks that we're putting out. Everything's finished except for the cart. We're putting the final touches on that. So all of these books will be available online. Um, you'll be able to notate in them. We'll put sticky notes on them. You'll be able to bookmark pages, uh, things like that. And the nice thing about those online resources is every January 1st, they update. They update to the new version, okay? And so Code Advisor and, and, the, and the books, they're subscription-based, so they update to the new versions. Uh, the physical book, you bought a book, it is what it is. But uh, a lot of people really prefer having a physical book in hand. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's all good stuff. I'm trying to see other questions to answer. Uh, full zirconia uh, falls into, yes, full zirconia uh, crowns, those are just considered porcelain ceramic. So you're going to be using the same codes that you would use to code porcelain ceramic. Let's see. Oral radiology reports from a third party. Okay, there's a particular code for that. It's D0391, I believe it is. That is, so that's using, um, when you take a CBCT or any image, could be a pano, could be a, uh, just a PA or whatever, and you're sending it to someone else to uh, look at that and evaluate and do a report, do diagnosis, evaluation, give you a report. You will originally use, instead of your normal capture uh, codes that you're using currently, the normal codes that you're using to take an x-ray, those include both capture and diagnosis if you're looking at the codes, okay? There's another set of codes that say almost the same thing, but they'll say image capture only. So if you're the provider that's taking the picture, that's what you'll do. Look up the appropriate code that's for a byte wing that's image capture only, or for a pantograph that's image capture only, CBCT that's image capture only. All those codes are there. And then that image can be then stored and transmitted to some other provider, like a radiologist, or something like that, that person on that end is going to do a D0. And like I said, I think it's 391. Don't hold me to that. That's And what is that is imita uh, uh, image. Uh, I, don't know, I can't remember the exact wording. I looked at it earlier. It's, it's uh, not associated with the practitioner that captured. So it's, it's the evaluation and the interpretation. That's what it is. That's my words. Interpretation and evaluation or something like that of digital images not associated with the practitioner that captured it. Some kind of verbiage like that. But all that means is they're reading the x-ray and it also says including report. So they have to write up a report about what their findings are and send that back to the original practitioner. So that's how that stuff is coded out when that happens. Okay, guys, we're already 10 minutes after. Um, I'm going to, uh, here's a good one right here. I want to maybe end with this one. Is D0180 limited every one to three years? And I know what you're thinking, okay? Because uh, the D0150 has got some verbiage in there about three years, okay? First off, you can't just do a 150 every three years on a, a patient that's in your office. That's a no-no. There are practitioners that are doing that. That's miscoding. Uh, if you look at that, it says you could do one every three years or, or you could do one on a patient if they have been absent from the practice for three years. Okay. So that's the stipulation about the 150, the comprehensive oral examination. If they've been gone from the practice for three years or they have major health changes, that's another caveat then you can do another D150. As far as 180 goes, this is the only code that works like this. It can be a comprehensive exam, periodontal exam on a new patient that you've never seen before. It can also be used on recare visits. You can use D0180 along with the 4910. 4910 does not include an evaluation. So 
You can actually do a 4910 along with a D0180 if you're capturing all that periodontal, all those records. If you're going through and doing uh, probing and bleeding points and, and all that kind of stuff, again, why not try to get paid for it? They may pay for it, they may not, but why not go ahead and try and code what's not only the more proper code, but it opens the opportunity for better reimbursement. And that's the D0180. So no, you don't have to wait one to three years to redo that code. You can actually code it multiple times in a single year, okay? Only, only comprehensive code that works that way. Uh, so it can be used for the initial patient visit and it can be used for a recare visit. Now we may, you may even wanna charge differently for those, those two different situations. You can have a fee A and a fee B. So a D0180A and a D01801801B in your you know, practice management software, something like that. Um, guys, I think we've probably wrapped up about time. We've got, it's already 10 after, I don't wanna hold y'all, but I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity for us to be here with you today. Again, reach out. Uh, we've got, uh, there's the Henry Shine contact information. I want to make sure that you uh, reach out to them. Uh, if you want to learn more about eAssist, uh, you can also contact us at practicebooster.com directly. Here's my little whoop, other side, little website logo down here. Okay, my little logo up here. Um, and so contact us about your coding, res coding resources, admin questions, that kind of thing. We'd love to hear from you there. Uh, going through Henry Shine is the best way to purchase the materials. Um, so contact your Henry Shine reps. They'd love to hear from you and help you with these resources. And this webinar, uh, I believe, is going to be available. Is that right, Adam? Is that is that going to be on? Uh, yes, sir. On the webinar page. So so going forward, you'll be able to review this, or if someone in your office you wish had seen it needs to see it, they're going to be able to review this. So again, thank you so much. And Adam, I'm going to throw it back to you. I appreciate it today. Awesome. Thank you. We appreciate you as well. We did record tonight's webinar, so we'll get that out to you sometime in the next week. And as always, we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up as you exit. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for asking all the questions and have a great night.